So the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce you to our uh, comprehensive online installation tools and to give you the most important points to remember when installing glass tile and then do our best to answer your questions about installing glass tile. And what we're going to cover is a little bit about Oceanside glass and tile, how to identify quality glass tile, substrate preparation, installation materials, step-by-step -step glass tile installation instructions, how to cut properly, and finally, a little bit about sealing and maintenance. And at the end of each section, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, and then while this is scheduled for an hour, we will stay on the line um, or on the webinar for as long as you guys want to and talk about glass tile installation. Um, when you do ask your questions, if you wouldn't mind sending in where you are in the country so we have an idea of uh, where else people are, that would be great. So just a little bit about Oceanside Glass Tile. We were founded 25 years ago by three artists whose vision was to bring beauty into the home and into the living space, both the interior and exterior living space. And the goal of technical services is to provide the installer the tools that they need to really execute the beautiful design that the architect and designers have come up with and so that we make it as easy as possible for you to have a durable, long-term, successful installation. And Brian and I, as we mentioned, we're both tile setters, so we bring our expertise from the field to the company. And Oceanside Glass Tile is unique in this regard. I think we're one of the few companies in the world that actually have on staff former tile setters who have field experience. So um, Brian and I like to joke that we speak installer and we, um, we understand that language. So how we provide support is in three basic ways. One, we answer a toll-free technical services line, and it's listed up there on, on the slide. And not only do we answer the toughest installation questions, but we answer the easiest. So Brian and I speak with everyone from the first-time tile setter or homeowner who's picked up their tile on Friday afternoon and is planning to do a, uh, a backsplash over the weekend, all the way up to the architect who is very familiar with our product and needs help with the specification for a commercial job outside the country. So we, we really talk to the range of everybody. And if you provide that toll-free number to your customer, whether that's an end user, a tile setter, someone who's not familiar with Oceanside, they're only going to speak to Brian and I. And they're not going to speak to a salesperson. They're going to talk to a tile setter and someone who is actively installing tile in the field. Brian and I have a little side business where we um, install, um, we try to install Oceanside glass tile. Our, our favorite job to do is a backsplash where we install it one weekend and grout it the next. But we've actually installed our products in the field with the products that we recommend in our installation instructions. And we know what it's like to grout an Extratos backsplash on a Sunday afternoon. So just be confident when you refer people to that toll-free line that we really will talk to anybody at any level from the most simple question to the most complex. What we use to back up our, our phone conversation are installation instructions, um, which are available online. And we've been building out this resource for a number of years now. It started out many years ago with a four-page set of photocopied instructions that went out with the orders, and now we have nine or ten different installation instructions and videos and a lot of tools that you can use. So if you don't want to call us and talk on the phone, you can use our online resources. And then lastly, we, uh, we will come out into the field and do installation training. That's what we're most used to doing. Today, Brian and I are sitting behind a conference table. We're used to standing in front of a gigantic audience and doing it live. So this is a new method for us to present our information, and we're really excited to try this out and see how it works for you for training. So these are our new installation instructions, and it is an eight-page document, and it is included um, one per order. It's not one per box, um, and on every single box, on the rare occasion that our instructions aren't included, then there's a, a sticker on every box that says installation instructions available at installogt.com. They're also available in Spanish. We don't print those and put them in the box, but they are available for download. And on the front and back of the installation instructions, it says in Spanish, installation instructions available at installogt.com. 
so uh, you've heard me reference three times already, install OGT.com, and, and that's where we house all of those resources. That's where we have our videos, and this is a list of the nine additional sets of installation instructions that we have available. If we put everything that we wanted to um, train on into one document, we counted one day, it would be 30 pages. So we decided that as opposed to printing 30 pages, not very environmental, and the thicker the book is, the more likely it is someone to pick it up and throw it away, we broke it out, and these are the tools that you can access online, and our hope is to do additional webinars where we can train on each one of these. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian now. If, does anybody have any quick questions at this point? Okay, cool. I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and he's going to cover how to identify quality glass tile. So before we get into the actual installation of our products, we wanted to talk a little bit about quality uh, and the things that separate quality tile materials from, uh, from inferior products. And with a glass tile, there are some particular things in the manufacturing process that can lend themselves to a more durable uh, product, not, not, as, not just more durable, but also more beautiful. So uh, when we get in and we start digging into the details of glass tile manufacturing, one of the critical components is annealing. Uh, annealing is a process by which we cool a glass tile. During the manufacturing process of glass, uh, glass manufacturing, excuse me, you are forming hot glass. So you take hot glass, it hits a relatively cool mold, um, relatively cool compared to the 2000 degree glass, and it, that process imparts stress into that material. There's no way around it when you're forming glass almost instantly into a particular shape, casting it as we do, that process will form stress into that material. We have to then put it through a secondary process in this machine here that you see on your screen called a leer, and this anneals the tile. Uh, it's fairly complex. You have to heat the tile back up to a certain temperature and then move it through very controlled zones of uh, cooling. Uh, process takes about two hours, uh, depending on the thickness of that material. Uh, and this is a, a, a fairly expensive, labor-intensive, energy-intensive process. You can see here we have multiple layers. Each one of those pieces of machinery costs a lot of money. Uh, it does add some cost to the production process, uh, which is why some manufacturers skip it. Uh, but it is critical to the performance of the tile. And we can show you a little demonstration here of what some tile looks like when it's annealed versus not annealed. So this demonstration shows uh, the tile under... Uh, some polar plastic with a light source behind the tile. We have a piece of equipment uh, at our factory called a Polaris scope, which is much more complex than this little setup here. But what this simple demonstration does is it, it visibly represents the residual stress within the material. So you can see this tile on the left has not been properly annealed. The material on the right has. It's our material that's been through the, uh, uh, through the annealing process in the Lear. So those light areas that show up within the tile as we put it through this process are areas of stress. Well, why is that important? That stress is basically front-loading that tile, making it more prone to failure. If you think of it as a piece of rope that's been stretched out taut, uh, a, tie, a rope that has a couple thousand pounds of pressure on it, you just touch it with a knife, it explodes. If you have a, a rope that's relaxed, you have to put a lot more effort into trying to get that to fail. Same is true with the glass and the glass tile. The tile on the left here with that stress, residual stress within the material would be uh, much easier to cause to fail with uh, thermal expansion, uh, substrate deflection, mechanical shock, anything like that in the field that a tile might experience, it would be more likely to fail. That's really important. So you can see the tile on the right, really none of that light area shows up. That's, that's what a properly annealed tile should look like under this demonstra demonstration. And it is critical. Obviously you don't have a piece of polar plastic in the field. You're, you're not going to be able to put the tile under a polariscope if you're in the showroom. What you want to do is ask the manufacturer, is the tile properly annealed? And we put the word proper, properly in there because we, on occasion, have people say, oh, yeah, it's annealed. We let it cool to room temperature. That is not annealing. That's letting it cool down in an uncontrolled fashion. It's very inconsistent, and you get uh, a wide range of residual stress within the materials. So it's really critical. Ask the manufacturer. Uh, ask them to provide some sort of documentation, if at all possible. So, so any questions there on annealing or quality with glass tile?
All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions. We're going to move on to the next section. Here we're going to talk a little bit about material inspection, uh, what to do when you receive your tile. Uh, obviously, you want to inspect the product. We're going to talk a little bit about special patterns and orientation of sheets for uh, gradients and things like that, and talking about the approval process from the owner owner's representative. So first and foremost, uh, obviously, when you receive a tile, you're going to want to inspect the tile. The process for doing that, we we outline in great detail in the new set of instructions. There's a slightly different process depending on whether or not the tile is on a sheet. Uh, also, what type of sheet is it on? Is it on a film, clear film face material, or is it on a paper face where part of the tile is obscured? Uh, so you're going to go through an inspection process to look for sheet to sheet color consistency, order accuracy, make sure you got all of the material you ordered, it's the right material, uh, but also just taking a quick look at the product. We do want to note that bubbles, wrinkles, and folds are normal in our cast glass tile. We do occasionally get the call from the concerned installer or homeowner who thinks they see cracks in their material. Uh, I can tell you almost 100% of the time those quote-unquote cracks are actually just the inherent wrinkles and folds in the material. Next, we're going to talk about a little bit about specialty patterns. So we do make some custom materials. The majority of our products uh, are just like your normal standard tile, where they don't need to be installed in any particular orientation or order. Uh, they just, if it's a one by one mosaic, you just install the one by one mosaic as normal. But we do have some very specialty uh, patterns and gradients, which will come with sheets that have arrows and orientation uh, or lettering and numbers, those types of things. So. Uh, you, those types of orders should also come with a, an installation layout diagram. If for any reason you get an order or a customer has an order and they are confused as to how those sheets are to be installed, please give us a call. Uh, it's usually pretty self-evident and pretty obvious when you lay the sheets out. You can see the arrows, see the numbers. It usually makes it's intuitive and it makes a little bit of sense. But if there's any question, give us a call. We can look at the order pull up any documents that may be associated with that order and give you a little bit of guidance as to the right way to go. We also have some information in our instructions about getting approval from the owner's or owner's representative. And this is, there's kind of a two-step process for this. First is just the inspection when the material shows up, check the labels, check the product itself, make sure everything's correct. But we also know that as a uh, translucent material in particular and with paper face products, uh, as material gets installed, there's another level of, of inspection that can happen, and the appearance can change dramatically depending if you're using the right installation materials or not. You can get into that in more detail. So it is critical to get an approval as the tile is being installed, particularly with paper face mosaics. So we have added some language in our instructions recommending that you get uh, approval after the first five square feet of tile installed. This doesn't have to be a, a uh, a massive in-depth process, literally get up five square feet, pull the paper, make some adjustments, and have the uh, owner or owner's representative, designer, whoever it is making that call, review that, whether it's a photo or actually in person, and get that approval before getting the, all of the tile installed. If you need to change direction, whether it be with the thin set or you've identified a problem with the material, it's a lot easier to address at that point than once you have uh, several thousand dollars worth of tile installed. So any questions here on the material inspection? All right. So we're going to move on and talk a little bit about substrate preparation. Obviously, sub any substrate preparation is critical for tile installation. A tile installation is only as durable or stable as the substrate to which it is bonded. But it does get even more critical with glass tile. Glass has very high breaking strengths, but it is also very brittle. It does not like movement, and it requires a very stable, stable substrate. The addition of things like translucent glass tile also adds some complexity to this process. So first and foremost, we'll talk about the fact that not all substrates are suitable for glass tile. We'll go through some TCNA methods, get into more detail about some translucent glass tile, and uh, talk about some of the other uh, resources we have online for things like substrate buildup. So first and foremost, not all substrates are suitable for glass tile. As I mentioned before, glass does require very, very stable substrates. Uh, and there are some substrates used in the tile industry for things like porcelain or ceramic that are not okay for glass tile. Um, one of the, 
I don't want to say most popular, but a very common issue we see in certain regions of the country are single float mortar beds. These are, uh, these are mortar beds where installers put up a sheet of green board and a three wall tub surround. They throw up a layer of wire, usually it's something like KLAF or chicken wire, which is not appropriate either. And then they just put up a single coat of about half inch of mortar. We require a two coat mortar bed over diamond lath, that's the appropriate weight, where you put up a single coat, uh, you scratch that first coat, you let that cure, you come back, you put a second coat over that, and allow that to fully cure before the tiles installed. That single float mortar bed is much less stable, and you can see here from this photo, this was a single float mortar bed where the entire substrate started to move and flex, and it cracked through the tile. Uh, this may or may not have been a problem with the porcelain, but it was a very obvious problem with a, uh, with a glass tile. So that's first and foremost to keep in mind. Along those lines, to give you some instruction and some guidance along these lines, we provide very specific substrate preparation methods from the TCNA handbook for ceramic, glass, and stone tile installation. If you're not familiar with this book, uh, I'm sure most of you are, it is the tile industry bible for substrate preparation methods and, and installation. If you are ever involved in a, a contentious situation or legal action, this would be the reference that the, the attorneys would go to or consultants would go to. To, to tell whether or not it was done properly. Um, if you don't have a copy of this, it's, uh, you should go get one at tcnitile.com. It's available uh, there for download. You can purchase a digital copy. So the way we provide guidance on these methods is we have a chart in the instructions. Uh, we've tried to break it down and, and simplify it. The, the handbook is now, I think, over 100 pages long. It's a very detailed book with a lot of information. There's no way we could provide that level of detail in our instructions uh, without it being completely overwhelming and a total waste of uh, paper and resources. So what we do is we make reference to those various methods within the handbook, and we refer to their alphanumeric designation here. So the way this works is if I have a wall installation, I'm an installer, I'm showing up on a job, I have a wall installation, I look down at that bottom chart, find the walls, uh, the construction is standard residential wood stud construction, so I go down to the next category there, wood studs. I'm doing an interior installation in a shower and I want to use backboard. So I go there and I can use either W244C or W244F. And if you look in the handbook and look at those two methods, you'll find a CAD drawing, uh, some very detailed requirements within the, the materials. Uh, the difference between C and F is that one is for uh, cement backboard and the other is for fiber cement backboard. They're very similar methods, but there are some slight differences depending on the type of material you're using. So that's just an example of how you would use this chart. This is a great tool for architects, designers who are specifying uh, that an installation is going to be done because basically what it does is it levels the playing field. So you say prepare the substrate per 244C and install the tile per the ocean side glass and tile instructions. You're basically you're getting a, a, a uh, apples to apples bid from an installer. Uh, whereas somebody who comes in and bids it using a mortar method may have to charge a little bit more money because that takes a little more time and then they're not they're not bidding it uh, fairly against their competition. So it's a great, great resource in our instructions. So now we're going to talk a little bit about translucent glass tile. A translucent glass tile does add a level of complexity to the installation, both in the material selection for installation, but also in the substrate preparation. In our instructions under this chart, we have several um, bullet points with substrate requirements. There are several that talk about uh, the requirements for translucent glass tile. So we talk about things like waterproofing. We have uh, requirements for taping, treating CBO, CBU joints, cement board joints priming drywall, and we talk about moisture management. So these things all add a level of complexity. For example, waterproofing with a translucent tile can, can be problematic. We do not recommend for shower applications that you have a topical waterproofing over your substrate with a translucent tile installed directly over it. Reason is moisture can get trapped between those two layers in the thin set and can cause some darkening. We talk about treating CPU joints, allowing them to cure for a full 48 hours. If you tape a joint with thin set, with an opaque tile or a porcelain, and you come back and set over it a few hours later, you're not going to probably probably not going to have an issue. You do that with a translucent tile. You have two layers of thin set there that are now one slightly cured, the other one's fresh. It can cause a color change there in your thin set, which then you can see through the tile. Same thing with priming drywall. You want to make sure you don't want to leave exposed joint compound, which can change the color of the thin set as it dries. So putting a layer of primer over that 
evens everything out, make sure everything cures evenly and the color is, uh, is consistent. Lastly, we talk about moisture management. You can see here in this shower floor photo, this is a shower floor that was almost built correctly. Now, it was a mortar bed over a waterproof uh, pan. It was sloped correctly, but the problem was the weep holes were not correct. Uh, weep holes were not protected. And as a result, the moisture that got through the tile went down into the shower floor, started to collect around the drain. It could not get out through the weep holes in the drain assembly, and it started to darken the circle right around the drain. So this is a problem with trans Lucent tile is a problem with light colored stone. Uh, it would eventually be a problem with opaque tile or, or porcelain, but it would probably take five or six years until the owner started to notice a musty smell in the shower, maybe started to get some mold on the grout joints. At that point, uh, you're, you're so far removed from the installation that it's probably not going to generate a callback. This will generate a callback very quickly. Uh, so we, we have some detailed information on that in the instructions. Lastly, we want to talk a little bit about uh, substrate buildup and really highlight the fact that we have some additional resources for you online. Um, again, we can't include everything in the instructions that come with the tile. There's so many scenarios for installation. But we do, in several locations, refer people to our website, installogt.com, to get additional resources. One of those documents is a substrate buildup document. Uh, for a substrate buildup would be a scenario where you have a thicker tile being installed in a shower. You want to install a, a quarter inch cast glass tile with that material and have the two be flush on their finished surface. Uh, there are very particular ways we recommend you do that. Um, obviously, if you do build up too quickly with too much thin set, you're never going to be able to install uh, mosaics. It can cause cracking. Uh, there, there, it can be problematic with translucent glass tile. So the document there to the right, we have three different methods depending on the variation. You can see there we have a method for a quarter to an eighth. We go on greater detail with uh, uh, quarter to three quarters and then above that. So uh, great, great resource, installogt.com. There's additional uh, documentation at that location. All right, we have a uh, question. Got a question from is it Wilton in Connecticut. So when we're talking about substrate buildup, you're not referring to the final thin set bed, correct? You're talking about the floating. Um, it depends on the context. So when we talk about substrate preparation in general, yes, we're talking about the, the application of a mortar bed or a cement board. We're not talking about the application of the thin set for the, for the actual ad adhering the tile. When we're talking about it in the substrate buildup section, um, sometimes that can you can use thin set to do that small level of buildup, but it's a secondary process that's done prior to the tile installation. You basically apply a very thin layer of thin set, flatten it, get it even, and then allow it to fully cure 72 hours. So I hope that addresses your question. Uh, we got another question from Karen asking the website. Uh, it is www.installogt.com. OGT as an Oceanside glass tile. Uh, that's sort of our generic landing page shortcut that gets you to all of our installation documentation where the, the documents are for download and we also have some videos. All right. All right, so for installation materials, I'm going to turn you back over to David. Thank you, Brian. Nice work. So installation materials. Um, this is the next section in our installation guide or installation instructions. And I think that generally people don't give installation materials a, a lot of consideration because most of the tile we're installing is opaque. But we can't stress the importance of considering your installation material selection when you're installing a translucent tile. The majority of the tiles we sell are translucent. We do sell some opaque ones, but um, most of our recommendations and our instructions really are driven by the translucent nature of our tiles. So we dedicate a whole quarter of a page in the instructions, <clears throat> excuse me, to talking about uh, how to properly prepare prior to installing the tile. So not all thin sets are appropriate for translucent tile. As you all know, there's a wide range of product on the market. They range from $10 a bag to $50 or $60 a bag. And just like anything else in the world, you get what you pay for. Uh, 
more expensive thin set, has more chemical modification, and has a higher level of performance. So this is a, a photo of a job, unfortunately, where they didn't consider the translucent nature of the tile. It was a well-installed job. Drop joint spacing looked good. They put in a movement joint. The problem was that midway through the job, they ran out of thin set, so they went out and bought um, what appears to be a specific glass tile thin set. So they, everybody thought that was a tile issue. When we took the tile off the wall, we found that the tile was exactly the same color. This was a thin set issue. And this is something that as people, more and more people install translucent tile, obviously it needs to be considered. So to um, help people, we've provided a list of recommended thin sets. So this is our list. As a, I'm not sure that I mentioned, we haven't reviewed or uh, rewritten our installation instructions in about 12 years, so or since 2012, and that's seven years, I think five years. My math is always bad when I'm presenting. I apologize. I lose any ability to do calculations. Um, so if you are familiar with our old installation instructions, you'll re recognize that we've removed some thin sets that are no longer available, and we've added some. So the Ardex product, the X77, and the Bostic Glass made our new products that we've added to our installation instructions. And we want to thank um, the installation material manufacturers for working with us on these recommendations and for developing glass-specific installation products. We've tested all of these products in conjunction with the manufacturers, and you can be confident if they're on our list that they perform well and they're warranted for the application. And Four of them on the list are bright white and color controlled. And this is really important when you're installing particularly a light translucent tile. So products of ours like oxygen or clear or cane, the color of the thin set is going to have a significant impact on the appearance of the tile. And that's one of the reasons we have grouted sample boards at our distributor locations because how a tile looks on a swatch card and how a tile looks when it is installed and grouted can be significantly different. And it's really important that if you have a customer, particularly a picky customer, that you may want to do a grouted sample board showing them what the thin sets, the tile's going to look like when installed and grouted because the whiteness of the thin set, once again, is going to impact its appearance as well as the, how the light travels through the edge of the tile once it's grouted. So, um, not all thin sets are created equal, and these manufacturers provide quality products, and we're proud to partner with them to make these recommendations. So thank you, every <clears throat> thank you everybody. So while thin set um, is, is going to be the driver, picking the right grout is important as well. And we often hear customers say, well, the installer said I had to use white grout, and this is not accurate. You can use any color grout you want. Um, grout is not as much of a performance concern as a thin set, but when we, when we first started making recommendations, it was very simple. Grout our tile with sanded grout, and yes, that sanded grout. Sanded grout does not scratch our glass tile. Our product, due to the cast manufacturing process, we have a more durable surface than some other products on the market, and we've been recommending sanded grout with our product for 25 years without issue. But as you, everyone knows, there are a number of new grouts on the market. There are premixed urethane products. There are high-performance grouts. There are other premixed products. And it's gotten rather complex, and there are new products being introduced all the time. So to that end, we developed a grout selection chart, which is once again available at installogt.com. And the driver of that is the opacity of the tiles. So certain premixed grouts we only recommend with our opaque tiles. We're not going to spend a lot of time going through that chart today, but you do have options. And as they add new grouts on the market, we'll continue to update this chart. So if you don't want to look at the chart, just know that you can specify sanded grout with any of our products. But if you want to consider a urethane-based product or a premix product or a high-performance grout, those are definitely options that are available. So that's the, uh, that's the grout selection chart, and that's what it looks like. Um, that little version on the right. Movement joints, everybody's least favorite topic, um, but they are a crucial component of a successful installation, and as much as designers don't want to use them, when you leave them out of a job, you are decreasing their performance. 
glass tile expands and contracts at a greater rate than other tile materials, and that expansion needs to be allowed for. So the way we think about a three-wall tub enclosure, for example, those are almost three separate tile installations. You have your tile installation on the back wall and then on the two short walls. And that transition at that 90-degree plane needs to be free of steady material, free of grout, and filled with a flexible sealant. And so it's an important component of the tile installation. And when installed, it's going to give you a, a durable, high-performance installation. When you go outside versus inside, particularly in submerged applications, the recommendations are different, and Brian and I are here to work with you on those specifications. So if you have a 30 linear foot overflow in Florida, and you call us up and want to know a more specific recommendation than every eight feet, then we can work with you on that. We know how much our glass tile expands, and based on the temperature change from summer to winter, we can tell you how much movement you need to allow for in the installation. Don't be that installer. So I like this, uh, I like this little cartoon up here. And as we were looking at it, we found an interesting mistake. I don't know if it's a mistake, but if anybody can identify what's unique about that uh, comic, I'll send you an Ocean Care t-shirt. Focus on the trowel. I'll give you five more seconds to review it and then send it into our moderator, Jennifer, and I will send you out an Ocean Care t-shirt. Okay, any questions about installation materials? Looks like we have a couple. William White. So, no epoxy to set in steam shower applications. So um, William's asking a quick question about whether epoxies can be used in steam showers. And several years ago, they changed the recommendation in the TCNA handbook that required membranes in steam showers. And so at that time, we started saying you could not install our translucent tile products in that application because we were concerned about what Brian referenced, the moisture becoming trapped between the impervious substrate and the impervious glass tile and darkening the setting material. And at that time, we didn't recommend epoxy installation materials. And that's our general recommendation still. However, there are some epoxies on the market that are bright white that can be used with our product. And it's driven for us, it's based on the format size of the tile and um, it's translucent nature, which one of our translucent tiles it is. So if you do have a steam shower and it, you want to put our translucent tile in, we will make an alternate recommendation, but we make that on a one-off basis. And we are developing our epoxy specifications as we do this presentation. So it's really something that you see from us in the future. But for the time being, please just reach out to Brian and I. Tell us what the format size is and what the opacity of the tile is, and then we'll give you a recommendation whether an epoxy would be a good choice or not. And um, Ardex WA is a, a bright white um, epoxy that we really like to use with our product, and um, Lightacrete makes another epoxy as well, the Light Epoxy 300, as well as some other manufacturers. So we can provide the specification if we have a little bit of information about the uh, installation. So we have a question, is epoxy grout sometimes too strong for certain glass tiles? And you're, what you're referencing is um, our longstanding recommendation not to use epoxy. And yes, there can be certain situations where a true 100% solid epoxy is not a good choice for glass tile, particularly in exterior applications with large format tile. So as the glass tile expands, because the epoxy has such high compressive strength, it doesn't allow it to move and it can become problematic. It can cause debonding or cracking. So once again, this starts to get a little bit complex because the recommendation when to use an epoxy grout or not is dictated by the format size of the tile and where, where it's installed. And so that's been one of our challenges as we develop an epoxy recommendation is to how to make a clear, concise, provide clear, concise direction to the installer. So once again, feel free to reach out to Brian and I, and we can answer your question. Um, and this is a recommendation that we've worked on with the epoxy manufacturers to provide guidance, like over this certain size, 
not a good idea to use epoxy, but under this certain size it is. Are all of these recommended thin sets and grouts okay for swimming pools from Jennifer? So it's a great question, Jennifer, thank you. We have pool-specific installation instructions, and what we've done is that's what we'd suggest you reference for the list of the thin sets that we recommend for submerged applications. So there is some slight variation on that. So for pools, we have different installation instructions than every other installation areas because a pool is a demanding place to put a product and you need to consider waterproofing and the, um, the dynamic nature of that installation. So I would reference our pool specific installation instructions. I'm reading the questions. I apologize for the slight delay. How deep should the expansion joint be just to the depth of the tile or should it go into the thin set? So great question. The movement joint needs to be between the tile and the, the two surfaces. So in the corner, for example, there should be no thin set um, in that joint. And depending on the depth of the tile, it's going to dictate whether you need to put some backer rod in there or some bond breaker tape. So when you have a movement joint, it's the shape of a U. The sealant should only be bonded on the two sides. And it's a little hard without a, uh, a diagram to show you that detail, but it is detailed very well in the TCNA handbook, which is the method is EJ171, and it will show you how to properly detail a movement joint because there are a number of options. You can have a movement joint that goes through the substrate or just in the tile. And we don't have time to get into all of those details. We could do an entire two-hour presentation just on movement joints. but the space should be free of setting material and grout. And we often see jobs where they grout it and then they just run a little bit of um, sealant or caulk over the grout. That is not a movement joint. The movement joint needs to go be the depth of the tile. And the general recommendation is from the sealant manufacturers is a quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch at a minimum. However, I think that as you, you can reduce that slightly um, down to 3 sixteenths or a little bit smaller depending on the application. So this is our last question. Thank you, this is awesome. That's a left-handed trowel, boom. Right answer. Nice job, William White. You again. Nice job, William. You get an Ocean Care t-shirt. Okay, we're gonna move on now. Okay, step-by-step -step instructions. So, our old installation instructions had recommendations for paper face mounted product and unmounted tile. And because over the last five years we've added some additional products, we now also have recommendations for film face product and we've even added a mesh mounted tile. And I know some of you are going, what? Mesh mounted tile? But it's back painted and we've sourced the right mesh and the right glue to mount it properly and it's a beautiful product called Kinship. And so now we basically have recommendations for paper-faced, film-faced, unmounted, and mesh-mounted. So we've gotten a, a lot of questions recently because our Kinship product is on the market. Hey, what's the installation instructions? And I'm gonna start with the, the mesh-mounted because it's the easiest. Since it's back-painted and mesh-mounted, you're basically just gonna follow standard tile setting practice. I'm not gonna give you the alphanumeric designation from the tile industry because it's too esoteric, but you still need to follow all the other recommendations in the installation instructions regarding material, inspection, substrate prep, and selection of thin set. So um, that's the recommendation for mesh mounted. And now we're gonna go through the step-by-step -step instructions for the other ones. So paper-faced mosaics. Paper face mounting is the um, oldest method for mounting mosaic tile, and it has some real advantages from an installation standpoint because it gives you total control over the installation. And with the advent of mesh mounting and dot mounting, paper face has kind of drifted away as a method, but it is the oldest method, and as a tile setter, it's the one that I prefer, and I'm, I'm obviously a little biased, but I never have to apologize for my installation at the end of the day because if I'm following our instructions, I have total control and I can almost always land with whole or half tile layout. You're not going to see a little eighth inch sliver in a paper face mounted job. So it is a really nice way 
to mount a mosaic tile. There is a little bit of a learning curve. So that's, to that end, we provide a set of instructions with photos to detail the proper way to install a paper face mounted product. So I'm going to go through the steps now. Step one is to key the recommended thin set into the substrate. And this is something that I didn't do when I was installing because I didn't know how much performance it added to the installation. But according to the material manufacturers, you're going to increase bond strength between 25 and 30 percent. So using the flat side of the trial with just a little bit of thin set to force it in really increases bond strength of the thin set to the substrate. The next step is you're going to use a notch trowel to gauge the depth of the setting bed. And you'll notice that all the notches go in one direction. Those pretty rainbow patterns that you see being done out there, they look cool and they're fun to do, I can tell you, but they don't actually give you the highest performance. So you want all your notches to go in one direction. Historically, we've recommended a 3 16th by quarter inch V-notch trowel, and that's what the photo is of today. But as the format size of the mosaic goes up, you may want to move to a quarter by quarter square notch. And you can absolutely use a quarter by quarter square notch. The thin set's not going to come up through the joint if gauged properly. But it's going to depend on the format size a little bit. And we have some recommendations that are specific to the format size in the instructions. Now is where you deviate a little bit from standard tile installation practice. Steps one and two. You'd be doing that anytime you're installing a tile. Step three, this is driven by the translucent nature of our product. And you're going to smooth the trial marks out so you get a consistent setting bed. I can guarantee you that it is impossible, if you don't do this step, to flatten all the trial marks by just tapping the tile in well. And we've seen jobs where they haven't flattened the trial marks and you can see them through the tile. Sometimes they go away and then a month later they come back. So this is an important step. And you're going to set the paper face mounted product into the thin set while it's still fresh. And then you're going to use a wooden beating block and a hammer to tap it in. This is uh, going to give you the most flat, uniform surface. We don't recommend using a rubber grout float or a steel trowel at this point because those tools have a tendency to compress a little bit, particularly a rubber grout float. Our tile is handmade and it can have an ever so slight difference in thickness. It's very minor, but it is, can be there. And a flat wooden beading block taps the thicker tile a little bit farther into the thin set, and it's really how you get a nice uniform installation. And then on a floor, you can start wetting the paper right away, but on a wall, you're generally going to wait 15 to 30 minutes. And that recommendation is driven by the absorbency of the substrate as well as the ambient air temperature. That's why we give a range. And this step is what really se separates an average tile installation from an excellent one because if you remove the paper while you're installing, it gives you an opportunity to make adjustments to the individual tile pieces. And if you don't, you're going to see sheet lines. And you'll, you'll see jobs on occasion where you're like, hey, why are there sheet lines in the job? And that's because they didn't remove the paper while they're installing. And on occasion, we'll get an installer who calls us and says, you can't remove the paper while you're installing. It's going to interfere with the bond strength or um, the tiles are coming up. and these are simply not true statements. We've worked, we've done shear bond testing with this method over and over again. It's an industry standard, not just for our product, but for all mosaic tile. It's the recognized right way to install a paper face mounted product. And once again, when you're done with the job, it looks like each piece was set individually and you get a beautiful mosaic installation. So those are steps six, seven, and eight. And then you're going to let this installation cure for 24 hours. This is not tile setter 24 hours where you finish work at 4 in the afternoon and come back at 7 and start cleaning. Since we pervious and we're using highly modified thin sets, we need to let the thin set cure for a little bit longer. So let it cure for a full 24 hours and then you're going to remove the residual mounting glue from the tile. You're going to dry it and then you're going to it with the ground of your choice. And you go through the standard cleaning process, your initial cleaning, your clean wash and then you're going to buff it dry and you have a beautiful glass tile installation. That we recommend sealing with Ocean Care High Performance Penetrating Sealer. So this is a new addition to, um, to our installation instructions, the recommendation to actual some step by step photos for sealing. That is our private label line of sealer and cleaners and Brian's going to talk about that a little bit at the end, but you'll notice that there's a, this we do recommend sealing cement-based grout 
and natural stone with this product. So you can seal that while you're installing. Um, this sealer is, can be used on damp, uncured grout. That's something that's unique to our product and gives the installer the opportunity to make a little bit more money as opposed to having to come back three days later. And I, as an installer, never wanted to do that. When I was done an installation, I didn't want to drive a half an hour, 45 minutes to do a half an hour's worth of work and not get paid very much to do that. So Brian will talk a little bit more about that at the end. So film face mosaics, as I mentioned, this is a new addition to our uh, our product offering and new in the installation instructions. And you're going to notice that the steps are very similar, except for the recommendation to remove the paper 24 hours or the film 24 hours after installation. You can't remove the film while you're installing. You need to let the thin set cure. So we recommend waiting 24 hours and then you're able to grout right away. There is no residual mounting glue from the film, so you can just start grouting and finish up the job. And not all of our products are film faced, but some are, so we added those uh, additional specifications into the document. Unmounted tile. So there are some differences between unmounted tile versus mounted, and the, the primary differences are that we do recommend stepping up to a quarter by quarter square notch trowel. We've highlighted that in step two. And then step five is to back butter the tile. And this is really important to ensure 100% coverage. As I mentioned when I was talking about paper face mounting installation, back buttering the tile really keys the thin set into the back of the tile so you get a good bond. And that way when you're pressing a back butter tile into your fresh thin set bed, you're getting 100% bond and you're almost eliminating the potential for shade variation, which that's what we see when you don't back butter the tile is you can have some areas where the thin set doesn't fully bond. And if you had an opaque tile, that wouldn't matter. But with a translucent tile, you can see that void. And that's not a performance issue as much as an aesthetic issue. So it's something to, once again, is a key component to a successful um, unmounted glass tile installation. Any questions about that? I want to keep things moving so we try and stay on time. We do have a couple questions. So this, should the glue holding mesh always be water insoluble? And I would say that uh, it really depends on where you're installing the tile. If you are installing in a dry location, it doesn't really matter. But if you're installing a mesh-mounted tile in an intermittent wet location or a submerged application, then yes, having a, a non-water-soluble glue might be a really important component of, of that installation. I can tell you that we use a non-water-soluble glue to mount our product, and we feel it's really important. Other manufacturers may not, but that's something, as a tile setter, I would never install a water-soluble glue in a submerged application because, um, obviously, you could have a, a problem, particularly if the glue covers a lot of the back of the tile. Thanks for the question. If you were to remove a piece of tile after, after the tile fully cured, should you see thin sets stuck to the back of the tile? And should it be more than a ghosting of thin set on back of tile? So yes, generally, if you rem a properly installed tile, you should see a little bit of thin set on the back of the tile and a little bit of thin set on the substrate. So um, you have what's called a cohesive um, failure at that point. So um, there's a little bit of thin set left. That that should be the case. Yes. And in terms of how thick the thin set layer. Should should be on the back. If it's a translucent tile, we're, we're shooting for about a sixteenth. Obviously, it's impossible to gauge it exactly. You don't want to have a quarter inch of thin set, and you do want to have 100% coverage. So, sixteenth is what we shoot for, plus or minus, but you still want to get 100% coverage. One more question. What thin set would be recommended for a glass tile 4 by 12 piece or larger? So any of the thin sets on that list that we have would be recommended for a wide range. I, I think there is some limitation on one or two of the bags, about six by six or larger, and it says to contact the manufacturer. But I can tell you that for any product that Oceanside Glass Tile manufactures, 
any synth set that is on our list can be used for the entire range of product. So wet cutting mounted mosaics. So this is a, a new page that's in, included in the installation instructions. This was a standalone document that's also available at installogt.com. But we got such positive feedback about this that we decided to add it in on the second to last page in our document. And this basically tells you how to cut tile while it's still mounted on the paper, which is the most common question that we receive in technical services about um, how to cut our product. And we often get the call and they start with, you can't cut glass tile. And that's simply not true. You can absolutely cut glass tile. And we came up with this method basically from Brian and I being in the field doing backsplashes. And as you all know, there's a lot of cutting that goes along with the backsplash. And we got tired of cutting one piece at a time. So we sat down and we said, we need to figure out a better recommendation. And we came up with this. And for us, it's the single most valuable piece of information for the tile setter. And that's why we've included our instructions. When we first, I think when we first started selling glass tile, there was one blade that was made specifically for glass tile, the MK215GL. And as you can see from the list on the right, now there are a number of different glass tile recommendations. What I would tell you is that the inexpensive glass tile blades sold at big box stores do not cut as well as the ones that we listed. And we've intentionally left them off the list because if they don't cut, there's no need to spend money on them. The ones that are on our list work well with our product and provide almost a chip-free cut. So I'm quickly going to go through how to properly cut um, a paper face mounted mosaic. You'll see in step one, the first thing we do is we take a piece of quarter inch cement board and we cut it to about the size of the saw tray. And the reason we do that is because Generally, the groove that the blade runs through is about three quarters of an inch thick. And if you're trying to cut a quarter inch off of a one by one piece of tile, it's not going to be fully supported. And as the blade passes through the tile, it's going to force it down into the groove and will often crack the piece of tile or bend it, or not bend it, but push it down at an angle so you get an irregular cut. So this is a, putting a piece of quarter inch cement board. This is something I do when I cut any mosaic. I don't care if it's glass tile or porcelain because you get a much cleaner cut. The next thing you do is you lift the head of the saw motor up so it cuts about halfway through the cement board and you need the blade to pass through the tile but obviously if it passes all the way through the support you have two pieces so cut about halfway through and then take a second piece of cement board and cut it to about the size of the sheet and along one edge you apply a piece of foam weather stripping. And what this is going to do is when you lay that onto the tile that you're going to cut, it's going to prevent the moisture from getting underneath and wetting out the paper. And it's also going to stabilize the individual mosaic pieces. And if anybody's ever tried to cut a sheet of mosaics and you take your fingers and you're trying to hold all the little pieces as the blade runs through, it's inefficient and you don't get the best cut. And once again, we started using this technique for cutting non-glass tile because it really helped us get a, a nice straight true cut. So you're going to take your sheet, you're going to lay it on the saw tray, you're going to protect the side that you want to keep, you're going to turn the saw on, and then apply a little bit of downward pressure and push the tray through the blade. The trick to getting a smooth cut is to, or a clean cut, is to cut slowly with good water flow. Glass, diamond, glass blades have smaller diamonds in a tight, tighter matrix, so they have a tendency to cut, cut much more slowly than a porcelain blade. And this is the reason that, uh, that cutting slowly gives you that clean, chip-free cut. So once you turn off the, the saw, you're going to lift up the cement board. There'll be about a half to a quarter, three quarters of an inch of water on the paper. You're going to dry that off. You're going to flip the tile over on a flat surface and wipe the back. It's really important to not take wet tile and put it over thin set. It interferes with the bond. And you can see at the bottom, that's one of Brian's and my jobs. That was a pool water line we did. And you can see what kind of cutting results you can get with this method. We could never cut those little eighth-inch strips that are towards the bottom by hand. They would obviously be impossible to hold and install. But with this technique, we can template the inside of the skimmer box, lay that over the paper, trace it, and then we can actually cut a three, do a three- or four-sided cut and end up with these beautiful results. It's much faster to do as well. 
you'll see the little pop-up, don't dry cook glass tile with a grinder. There is no blade on the market that is recommended for cutting glass dry that we're aware of, and you're going to chip the edge of the tile and not get good results. So um, cut it with a wet saw. We have a quick question. Um, is can you cut the, use the same cutting method for film face? And the answer is yes. What I will tell you is that how the blade interacts with the plastic is slightly different than the paper. And we, I think that sometimes you have to cut a little bit more slowly because, and you have to dress the blade a little bit more regularly because the film can get into the matrix and bind up the blade a little bit. So paper is a little bit easier to cut with this method. You can absolutely do it with film. You just have to be aware. And one of the things that we make the recommendation to do is to dress the blade um, on a more regular basis. So when I was a tile setter, I didn't know that you were supposed to dress the blade. I learned that once I started working at OGT. And glass tile, because it's dense like granite, it needs to be, the blade needs to be dressed on a more regular basis. And you do that by running a, a rub stone or a brick or a cinder block through the blade to re-expose the diamonds and wear away the matrix. And when Brian and I are installing, sometimes we'll dress a blade five or six times during the day as opposed to uh, a porcelain job or a ceramic job where you don't dress your blade anywhere near that often. Any other questions about cutting or drilling? All right, we're going to keep going because we're starting to run out of time and I don't want to leave my, uh, my partner out in the cold here. All right, so we're going to finish up by uh, talking a little bit about sealing and maintenance with you guys. Uh, as David mentioned earlier in the presentation during the step-by-step -step installation instructions, we do have a private label line of sealing and maintenance products. Uh, it is called Ocean Care, uh, apropos name. So uh, first and foremost, I want to tell you that Ocean Care is not just for glass tile. That's a perception we, we've uh, dealt with since day one. It obviously is designed to work well with our products and other glass tile. A lot of our specialty cleaners are safe for things like iridescent coatings, which can be sensitive to acids. Uh, it's designed to work really well with impervious mosaics, but uh, our sealers and other things also work very well for natural stone. We have an enhancer. Uh, so it is, it is a great product line for all materials, not just glass tile. So just giving you some quick highlights of some of the things that differentiate the Ocean Care line. Um, we've tried to develop an, um, a, a broad product line that covers just about everything you would need in terms of a maintenance solution, but keep it a simple, easy to understand line. All of the labels are color coded. You can see here the penetrating sealer is a red label, enhancing sealer is orange. That way the customer walks in, they don't have to remember the exact name of the product they, they purchased. They just know they use the cleaner that has the purple label and they really liked it. Um, also the names are simple, penetrating sealer, enhancing sealer. You know exactly what it does. We don't have 18 different sealers that do different things. We don't have material specific sealers uh, and that comes down to our hybrid carrier technology which is the, um, the backbone of both of these sealers. The hybrid carrier means it's not a water or a solvent based, it's both. Uh, we have a little bit of solvent that's mixed in with this formula through a proprietary blending process. It gives us the performance of that solvent based sealer which is considered usually more of a professional grade product but it's a little harder to use, a little, a little stinkier but we get the, the environmental profile, the ease of use, all of the things that homeowners generally like about water-based formulas. Both of these products have that hybrid carrier technology, so really high-level performance, perform as good or better in our stain testing with all of the top shelf sealers with our competitors, and, uh, but really offers that ease of use for the, uh, for the DIYer as well. Uh, this product uh, is available through all Oceanside glass and tile dealers. They can order it from us. Uh, we do also have some stocking dealers a few of them are on the line with us today, and uh, recently it was added to Amazon. So if you have a customer who's just out somewhere where they just can't get to a showroom and pick it up, uh, it is available online at this point. So we don't have a ton of time to get into uh, all of the product specifics, uh, but we are going to just kind of show the line holistically here with Ocean Care. We have kind of three categories we like to break it down into protect, maintain, and renew. Protect is obviously things like sealers, surface protectants, things that keep calcium from bonding to tile, uh, maintain are your general maintenance cleaners, and renew are some of our specialty cleaners, things like our calcium releaser, which is a non-acidic cleaner that can be used in pools. It won't damage iridescent glass tile, uh, porcelain tiles, grouts, that type of thing, but it does specifically target the calcium buildup 
Also so have some contractor driven products like intensive stone cleaner, grout haze remover, again, biodegradable, non-toxic, all things that fit in with our uh, environmental profile here at Oceanside Glass and Tile. It's a big driving factor for all of these things. Uh, our sealers meet the current requirements for VOC emissions, for tile and stone sealers, for lead projects, all of those things. So if you have any questions about this, please give David and I a call. Uh, these products were developed by David and I. We have a lot of uh, pride and, and ownership of this product line, so we love to talk about it. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting samples, talking to us about it, becoming a dealer, any of those things, give us a call. Any questions for the, the sealers and maintenance products? All right, it doesn't appear like we have any questions along those lines, so we're right up against our uh, time here, maybe a couple of minutes over. We really appreciate everybody's time here on the uh, on the the webinar. Um, Want to also take the opportunity to ask you a question here. We're going to take a little bit of a poll from the group. You know, this is a new technology for us. We we this is our first webinar. We want to do more in the future. This was obviously a very high level overview of the installation instructions. Uh, we couldn't get into a lot of nitty, nitty gritty detail, but in the future we may take one of these subjects and break it down in, in greater detail. Installation materials, cutting, drilling application process, whatever that is. So we wanted to pull the group. If, if we were to do another webinar, uh, wh where would you like to see it? Uh, you can throw it into the question box. You can reply to some of our follow-up emails that you're going to get with some of the documents. Let us know what you want to see so we can, uh, you know, if there's a recurring theme, uh, we can do that one first and, and try to get you guys the information you're looking for. I'm going to pass it over to David so he can say a quick thank you and then we'll, uh, we'll get into taking some of these questions that we still have lingering. Thank you, Brian, and most importantly, thank all of you for taking the time to be here with us today. We know how busy you are and um, how valuable your time is, so we really appreciate your attendance and looking, are looking forward to doing more of this with you. Please feel free to call Brian and I anytime. Brian and I are self-professed tile geeks. We love talking about our product. We love challenging questions. We want to engage with you, and that's why we're here, and we can't. Many of you are our longtime business partners, and we look forward to continuing that relationship with you and also building the relationships with our new partners. So um, our heartfelt thanks today for taking the time, and we'll stay on for as many questions, but those of you who need to go, we understand, and have a great day.